We've all learned about how the Wars of the Roses led to the rise of the Tudor dynasty, but the truth is, it was the steely determination of one woman who would not only project her son to the throne of England, but create a place for herself that made her the most powerful woman and politician in the court, Margaret Beaufort. Margaret was born on the 31st of May, 1443, at Bletsoe Castle, where she would also spend her childhood. It's likely she didn't rank very high for importance amongst her half-siblings. Her mother, Margaret Beecham, was married first to Sir Oliver St. John, giving birth to six children before his death. She then married briefly John Beaufort, and their only child was Margaret. After his death, she then married once more to Lionel Wells, to whom she had a son. Margaret's father John also had an illegitimate daughter named Tassin, who was brought up alongside her. So Margaret Beaufort was therefore a girl, not even the eldest girl, and had many half-siblings before her. And yet, she would rise well above the expectations held for her, which probably didn't extend much beyond her being a marriage pawn. Her father, John Beaufort, was the Duke of Somerset and a grandson of John of Gaunt. At the time of Margaret's birth, John was also preparing to leave for a military campaign in France. Before leaving, he negotiated with the King, Henry VI, that the wardship of his then unborn child, should he die in France, would be left to his wife, along with his lands. This was agreed, but shortly after his return from France, John fell out with Henry and died not long after. Some stated this was due to an illness, but at least one source suggested suicide. Whatever the sad circumstances, at only a few months old, Margaret Beaufort was now the heiress to her father's estate, which was a considerable fortune. She also inherited John's claim for the English throne through John of Gaunt. However, on her first birthday, Henry VI decided to renege on his earlier decision, instead granting wardship of John Beaufort's lands to William de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk. But Margaret was allowed to remain with her mother, who was actually pregnant at the time with John Beaufort's second child. Sadly, the child did not survive, leaving Margaret as the sole heir. Margaret had a happy childhood, however, and while girls in this period didn't always receive an education, her mother ensured she did. Margaret would have learned how to run an estate and manage lands, a necessary skill for noblewomen, as well as learning embroidery and sewing. Her family loved music as well, and Margaret would not only have learned how to play instruments, but entertainment was always present in her childhood in the form of minstrels, musicians and singers. But not all her lessons were practical. Alongside reading and writing English, Margaret was also fluent in French, something that was very desirable for a courtier. And in later life, she would always regret the fact she hadn't been able to learn Latin as well, knowing only a few words of it. Clearly, Margaret was an intelligent child with a thirst for knowledge and skills. She had a great love of books, and her mother bequeathed her many English and French books, items which would have been even more treasured than now, for they were handwritten rather than using the printing press, which hadn't been invented yet. Margaret's significance, however, was as a valuable bride. When she was only six years old, sometime in late January or early February of 1450, she entered into a marriage contract with John de la Pole, the Duke of Suffolk's son, who was himself only seven years old. It was obviously little more than an exchange of words which would today be considered a common-law marriage. The relationship would never go any further, 
as this marriage would be broken off before either party reached the age of consent, and Margaret never considered it to be her first marriage. The marriage happened only for political reasons, for William de la Pole ensuring his son would benefit from Margaret's lands and titles, something often done by wards of noble children. He had been impeached by this point, and was also ensuring his grandchildren would have a claim to the English throne, and he was arrested only a short while after. In the same year of Margaret's so-called marriage, events in England were becoming volatile. Henry VI, although guided, or as some saw it, manipulated by his wife, Queen Margaret of Anjou, was not good at running his kingdom. English possessions in France had been lost over the years, until by 1450, only Calais and Aquitaine remained. His court was rife with corruption and greed, as he was influenced by courtiers around him, including those in Margaret's family and her would-be father-in-law, the Duke of Suffolk. Many saw Suffolk as causing the most problems, and so Henry had been forced to throw his favourite into the tower before exiling him for five years. He would later be murdered before he ever reached another shore. But even with Suffolk gone, the problems at court remained, and as the crown was bankrupt, the people were burdened with heavy and obviously unpopular taxes. With Suffolk out of the way, it was Margaret's uncle, Edmund, who took over his vacancy at court. Edmund had, upon the death of his elder brother John, also taken over the title Duke of Somerset. He was popular with the king and queen, but not with many others, including his famous rival, Richard, Duke of York. The Duke of York was publicly outspoken against many of the king's policies and favourites, as well as being an intelligent and astute man, and so he was greatly disliked, in particular by Margaret of Anjou. By the end of 1450, York demanded Somerset be removed from court, along with other corrupt courtiers. The king and queen wouldn't hear of it, and so tensions built until February 1452, when the Duke of York began to march towards London with an armed force. He was descended from Edward III, both from his mother and father, and so had a strong claim to the throne. Some believed he just wanted the best for the country. Others thought he had ulterior motives for power. Margaret was possibly shielded from events as a young child, living within the safety of her mother's properties. But as she grew, it would have been impossible to not know about what was happening at court, especially as Margaret became of an age where she would be expected to join her mother at court. Just a year later, before her 10th birthday in February 1453, Henry VI commanded her mother to bring her to court. London was no doubt a huge contrast with the quiet, gentle, countryside upbringing Margaret had enjoyed so far. London was full of tiny, crammed streets, and the Thames was lined with the opulent houses of the wealthy, all overlooked by the great spire of St Paul's Cathedral. This was likely the first time Margaret had visited London, or met the King. Henry was not a typical vision of a king, eschewing high fashion and dressing simply, and he was known to be gentle and kind if quiet. The reason for the visit was to ensure the security of his own rule as well as the future of one of his half-brothers. Although Margaret was married in a sense, it was easy enough to break off as it was a mere contract made up of words. It could be brushed aside in an instant, and Henry had a new candidate in mind for her groom, his half-brother, Edmund Tudor, the Earl of Richmond. Interestingly, despite her age, it would appear Margaret was given some say over this choice, as recalled by a story she herself told to Bishop John Fisher years later. Although only nine years old, 
Marrying Edmund was not a foregone conclusion, as Margaret claimed to have needed the counsel of a gentlewoman whose identity is unknown, as she did not know what to do for the best. In other words, to retain her current husband or marry Edmund Tudor. It suggests she was given the choice. She was advised to pray for the answer to St. Nicholas, patron saint of children and miracles. And according to Margaret herself, she received a vision which told her to marry Edmund. The choice was made, and Margaret, already religiously pious, would from that moment on construct the story of her life in a narrative of following God and destiny's plan. Not much is known about the reasons for this second marriage, but it appears to have been a decision made by Henry VI alone. If his half-brother married a wealthy heiress, it would increase his income and therefore power, and for Margaret, she gained prestige from being a few steps closer to the throne for her future children. On the 24th of March, Margaret now became the ward of both Edmund and Jasper Tudor, the king's half-brothers, and her lands were divided between the two men, making them incredibly wealthy. Margaret would also have met the queen, now 23 years old, at the Garter celebrations at Windsor Castle on the 23rd of April. Margaret of Anjou was likely a dazzling sight in her jewels and finery, and the king gifted little Margaret a hundred marks for new clothes, in preparation for her first meeting with her future husband, Edmund. Despite the only known portraits of Margaret, all of them created after her death, showing her in a simple black gown and plain white headdress, Margaret was actually a big follower of fashion and loved expensive and luxurious fabrics and clothes. Just as in the centuries to come, making an extravagant outward impression was everything for the nobility and royalty. But just a few months later, events were to take a turn for the worse yet again. On the 15th of August of that year, Henry VI fell into a stupor from which he could not be awakened, seemingly conscious but unable to feed or care for himself. It might perhaps have been a mental breakdown or catatonic schizophrenia, but at the time was simply labelled insanity. Now finally pregnant after eight years of marriage, Margaret of Anjou had to take the reins of running the country while Henry was taken into seclusion at Windsor Castle. Her main problem was to prevent the Duke of York finding out about her husband's illness. In January of 1454, Henry was presented with his new son, the Prince Edward, but remained as silent as ever. As he was unable to acknowledge the baby boy as his own, wild rumours flew that the real father was in fact Margaret's uncle, the Duke of Somerset. While Margaret of Anjou saw herself as the natural regent, being French and a woman meant that few courtiers agreed with her, even those who were her allies. She wanted other arrangements made that didn't include the Duke of York, but on the 14th of February, Parliament entrusted Richard with ruling the country during the King's incapacity, naming him Lord Protector of the Realm. Queen Margaret was horrified. Little Margaret's family was affected as well, with her uncle the Duke of Somerset sent immediately to the Tower, and the Queen to Windsor Castle with her husband. However, the Duke of York was proving himself to be a good leader, repairing the damage many years of corruption had done and attempting to rein in the Crown's finances. While Edmund and Jasper Tudor remained loyal to their half-brother, they also willingly complied with the Duke of York's policies, appearing to have a genuine desire to see order return to Henry's kingdom. Even when, in order to curb the money bleeding from the royal purse, York reduced the royal households, including their own, they made no complaint. 
Both brothers also made an effort to appear at court and parliament when able. But then a miracle occurred, and Henry VI came out of his catatonia on Christmas Day, finally able to acknowledge his young son. York was dismissed, and to his fury, Somerset was released from the tower and restored at court. The Duke of York retreated to Sandal Castle, as he knew the Queen and Somerset would now be plotting his downfall. Not willing to wait for them, he raised an army, alongside his brother-in-law Richard Neville, the Earl of Salisbury, and Salisbury's son, the Earl of Warwick, also named Richard Neville, and known to history as the Kingmaker. They marched south, intent on restoring order and doing away with Somerset. When word reached the King and the Duke of Somerset on their way to Leicester for a meeting of the King's Council, Somerset immediately raised an army of his own, and the two forces met on the 22nd of May, just outside St Albans. Initially, the Duke of York tried to talk with the King, asking for him to surrender Somerset, but Henry refused. Violence broke out, and in less than an hour the royal army was defeated and forced to flee. The Duke of Somerset tried to hide within an inn in town, but he was soon found and killed. Margaret's uncle was finally dead, and the Wars of the Roses had begun. Not long after Margaret's 12th birthday on the 31st, just a few days later, she married Edmund Tudor at least by September of that year. It was a turning point for Margaret. Edmund was at least 13 years older than her, and they had only met once, so it is unlikely they had much in common to talk about. But unlike her common-law marriage to John de la Pole, this one was an official marriage, and Margaret would not be sheltered from events as she had been under her mother's care, as she was to live with her husband and take on the mantle of Countess of Richmond. Marrying Edmund Tudor also made her not just a cousin of the king, but his sister-in-law, and so tied her inextricably into what was to come. Although Margaret had been married at what the church considered the allowed age for marital relations and cohabiting for girls, 12 was still considered very young by most at that time, and many waited a few years after the marriage before consummation. For Edmund Tudor, that appears to not have been a consideration. Desperate in the light of the war to come to secure Margaret's lands, not only for himself but for his future children, the marriage was consummated just shortly after the wedding. Despite knowing the risks for Margaret as she was still physically underdeveloped for having a child, Edmund still laid with Margaret as his wife. It was a decision that would have far-reaching consequences for Margaret, leaving her with trauma and possible physical injuries. Despite this, Margaret would always later speak well of her first husband, despite their marriage lasting just less than 18 months and not seeing him for most of that, writing in her first will that she wished to be buried alongside him. However, it is unlikely that this was based on actual tenderness, and more on how she connected herself firmly with Edmund and the Tudor legacy, given that he was the father of the future dynasty through their child. The couple travelled to Pembrokeshire, Wales in the autumn, settling at the Palace of Lamphy. It was a luxurious country retreat that had once been a bishop's palace. Richard, Duke of York, had once again been named as Lord Protector, and Henry VI seemed to have accepted that York and his supporters would be playing a major role in governing his country. Edmund had been tasked to oversee the king's authority in Wales, the real reason the newly married couple were there. Tension grew between Edmund and Griffith ap Nicholas, the leading nobleman in Carmarthenshire. Griffith ap Nicholas was loyal to the Lancastrian cause, and after losing some of his properties and lands after their defeat at St Albans, Edmund's presence only made the wound worse. 
By early summer 1456, violence between the two men broke out, with Edmund taking control of Carmarthen Castle. Unfortunately for him, the Duke of York was constable of the castle, and he knew how loyal Edmund was to his brother. York immediately set about sending a small army to retake the castle. Around this time, after her 13th birthday, Margaret would also have known she was pregnant. While this was probably, as with most children, a happy event in the lives of both Margaret and Edmund, it was also a terrifying one. Childbirth was, and would remain for many centuries, one of the biggest causes of death for women, and midwifery was still a mystical subject practiced only by a few, and in its infancy for any serious scientific consideration. Even if she survived giving birth, she could die from postpartum bleeding or infection, and even then, there was a good chance her child would die before the age of seven. Meanwhile in London, York had once again been removed as Lord Protector by Henry VI, but he remained on the King's Council and as Lieutenant of Ireland. While attempts would be made at reconciling the houses of Lancaster and York, the seeds of distrust had been sown, and the tension mounting would only lead one way now. The 2,000 men the Duke of York had sent to Carmarthen Castle reached it in August, taking the stronghold on the 10th. Edmund was captured and thrown into prison. While a few months later he was released, Edmund remained at Carmarthen. It's not clear whether this was to watch over his brother's interests or because he was already ill, but certainly by the autumn it became clear he had contracted the plague. His illness and death were so swift that he didn't even have time to prepare a will, dying on the 1st of November. Edmund's death left a teenage, pregnant Margaret isolated and vulnerable in a Welsh palace, miles away from her family. Margaret now had to not only survive the dangers of power-hungry men who might take advantage of her widowed state, but also the very real possibility of contracting the plague, which would kill not only herself, but also her unborn child. At seven months pregnant, returning to her mother's estates in England was out of the question, but she also couldn't remain where she was. When Jasper Tudor found out about his brother's death, he was heartbroken but he was also immediately concerned for the well-being of his sister-in-law and her child. In the winter of 1456, he came to Margaret's aid, travelling to Lamphy Palace to take her and her child to his main seat of Pembroke Castle. Margaret knew she could trust Jasper, and in the many years to come, there was always an unshakable bond between the two, perhaps from the events after Edmund's death. The castle was a mighty stronghold, and positioned high on a rocky mount made it incredibly well defended. In the circumstances, it was the perfect place for Margaret to be. The only downside would have been the lack of other women to have as company, given that her brother-in-law Jasper was still unmarried at this point, and so Margaret would only have had her own household servants around her. In late January 1457, Margaret went into labour. Childbirth at this time had no modern medical interventions, no safe pain relief, and it's likely Margaret relied on prayer and her faith, like many women, to get her through labour. But this must have all been made worse by the fact she was so young. We know little details about the actual birth, but she must have been attended by at least one female midwife. But as she was still only 13 years old and underdeveloped, even the best midwife would have struggled to make the process easier for Margaret, as puberty had not occurred in its fullness. Margaret's labour was such a traumatic event that she would later establish, with the help of her future daughter-in-law Elizabeth of York, a set of procedures for future heirs to ensure the safety 
of both mother and child. On the 28th of January, after what must have been a terrifying and exhausting labour, Margaret gave birth to a son, Henry Tudor. Her confessor, Bishop Fisher, would later state it was a miracle that anyone had been born to someone of so little a personage. It is possible that the birth also physically harmed Margaret in the form of scar tissue or a damaged uterus, as Henry would be her only child, despite two more marriages. Many years later, she would ask Henry not to send her granddaughter, also named Margaret, too early to Scotland to marry James IV, fearful she would end up with the same fate. At the very least, Margaret was left with psychological scars. Perhaps with the knowledge he would be her only child, a strong bond developed between Henry and Margaret, and mother and son were always close throughout their lives. He was named, in a proud show of Margaret's family ties, for his uncle Henry VI. Margaret was now a mother and a widow, and was still only 13 years old. For the safety of her son and herself, she understood she needed to marry again, and this time she wanted to have a real say in who that would be. The war between the House of Lancaster and York was still only in its infancy, and Margaret could not have known the tumultuous events that were about to come, both for herself and for her beloved son Henry. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.